We're being inspired by all the green choices we're making out here both inside and out. Details on them coming up next. During my years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore and create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about design and blurring the lines between inside and out. Now, in today's show, we're going to focus on making green choices, choices that are environmentally friendly, good for the planet. Whether it's the flower borders we have up here or the vegetable garden and orchard beyond, and also it applies to the house and the construction of all the buildings and so forth. You see, what this property was designed for was to inspire others to think green. So in today's show, I thought we'd visit a building that was certainly an inspiration to me, the headquarters of Heifer International. You see, it was designed with the environment in mind. And we'll also visit another amazing green building, the Clinton Library, and get a rare look at the rooftop garden outside the former president's residence. And I'll also pass along a few ideas that will help you be green in some of the simple everyday things that pop. And if you enjoy these water-wise beauties, just wait until you see what's being done with them. So why don't we get started by checking out the progress in the house, come on. I like what I'm seeing in here, we're making some real progress and I like what I'm feeling. It's really cooler inside this house. It's high summer and 95 degrees outside and in here, I placed a thermometer in here yesterday and now it just reads just at 80 degrees. So that's a 15 degree difference from outside to inside this house. Now think about it, there's no heat and air yet. We haven't hooked up any sort of air conditioning. So this temperature difference is based on how the walls have been insulated. Now when the brick went on the house, that gave us a barrier on the outside, our outermost barrier. Now behind that brick wall is a series of studs where we use that foam insulation made from soybean oil, and then there's a big air space. And then as you can see here, the guys have just finished putting the drywall up. And what we used with the drywall was one that is moisture and mildew resistant. What that gives us now from the outside edge of the brick inside to the, the drywall is about 23 inches of wall. So this is like being in a little styrofoam cooler, if you will. That's why you already get that temperature difference. I love saving energy like this. The next step is to finish the drywall and they're going to begin on that tomorrow. So I'm very excited about it. So today they're clearing everything out of the floors to make ready for the workmen. Can't wait. I had a chance to visit the headquarters of Heifer International an aid organization committed to ending world hunger. Ray White tells us a little bit about the organization and what measures they took when building the headquarters to make it as environmentally friendly as possible. Heifer International is a solution to world hunger and poverty. We have projects in 57 countries around the world where we teach people how to become self-reliant by giving them livestock and training in how to use those livestock. It may not sound like much, but a cow or a couple of goats can actually transform the lives of a family living in a developing country. We realized over the 60 years that we've been working, we really need to be doing things in an environmentally sustainable way. It's very important that we do everything so that you don't degrade the environment. Everything Heifer does, we have to be environmentally sound. We expect that of our people in the field. We expect people who receive animals from Heifer to practice environmental sustainability. We would be hypocrites if we did anything else. We planned this building to be as environmentally sustainable as we possibly could make it. We also wanted the grounds around it and everything here to be contributing to environmental soundness, to making a, fine, a nice environment. It's nice for the employees because it's great environment to work in. One of the most impressive features about this building is this moat behind me. It actually acts as a way of capturing all the water that falls on this site. So we don't put anything into the city sewer system. We don't burden that system with our water. We also use the water to irrigate or keep all these plants alive. Another thing is we capture the water that falls on the roof. 
The roof is actually a swimming pool liner, and all the water drains into inlets and then goes to a 25,000 gallon water tower on the other side of the building. We use that in the radiant heating system that supplements the sun power that comes from all those windows. One of the things exciting is when you see the utility bills for this building because they're so low. We really have about half of the use of energy of a regular building. One of the things you can notice about the outside of the building is we have these light shelves and light shades that protect people who are sitting near windows from having direct sunlight fall on their workstation. If you have a cube that's right in the middle of the building, you still get reflected light from the light shelves that bounce it in through these high windows above the light shelves right into their workstation uh, as indirect light. So everyone has really pleasant indirect lighting at their workstation. There are things that you can't see about this building that contribute to the environmental sustainability of it. All the materials are recycled or recyclable. 90% of the steel is recycled steel. The furniture and furnishings inside are made of recycled materials. We're really having a lot of success with all of the different features here in the parking lot. This parking lot also collects water that goes into our retention pond that's at the end of the building, and then it comes back into the constructed wetlands and helps uh, flow right past our building and all these materials help eat oil and things that come off the parking lot so it's all contributing to making things cleaner and greener. You can see the wildflowers that we have. All these flowers are actually picked because they are local. They're, they are here to serve a purpose. They keep things green and clean and a lot nicer than they would be if it was just a bare parking lot. Ah, there's nothing like the sound of water. And as you can see, there's lots of it right here. Beautiful on a hot summer day. I want to take you up on this rooftop and show you a garden that's very green and very stingy on the use of water. Come on, let me show you. Debbie Schock gives me a tour of the rooftop garden at the Clinton Presidential Library. Now, this green roof is really just one component of a, of a larger picture, isn't it? Yes, Alan, this green roof sits on top of the William J. Clinton Presidential Library, and it is part of a city park for the city of Little Rock, and it's 30 acres, the entire park. So it's just a small little fraction of what this huge park is all about. The original deck was made out of the Ipe wood, and then we have the crushed granite down in the Scholar's Garden, so we brought a little bit of the Scholar's Garden up here. And then we tried to stay within Arkansas native plants when we put the plants up here. So it really reflects Arkansas. Well, this is really fairly new. It is. This is the first growing season. We installed this green roof in November of last year. So we actually had to take it down to the topping slab and rebuild it up to, to get this green roof created. And we actually did it in about 27 days. When the president is here, how much time does he spend out here on the roof garden? You know, before it was just white rock and there was nothing to attract him to come outside. And now he has this beautiful garden and he loves to come out here in the mornings when it's quiet, drink his coffee and enjoy the view and just the beautifulness of this roof. It, it's splendid, it really is. I just love all the native plants. I mean, well, it is just gorgeous. Now there's a, there's a huge green component to this as well. There is. Well, the president last year, you know, during the new construction, we received a silver uh, with the USGBC and two green globes with the GBI. So he was happy with that, but he said, you know, we can do more. So last year we went through a recertification with USGBC under existing buildings. And that's a building that has to be two years or older to qualify. So we took this through that whole process again. And part of the process was to add the green roof. And what it does is we, it insulates the building. So we've lowered our energy costs by putting the green roof up here. It also collects all of the water that falls when, during a rainstorm. This particular part of the roof garden has a, a certain feeling. It's very native and wild looking, but then on the south end of the library, you have a roof garden which has a very different sort of feel to it. It, it does, because when we were talking about the design, of course, this needed to feel like the Arkansas River. But the other side, there were some things that were important to President Clinton that I thought if we could get a little bit of component of that in here, that would even make his green roof more enjoyable. 
So what we've done on the other side is we have given him a little putting green um, so that he can go out and, and practice his game. And we've also added some yellow roses because Virginia Kelly, his mom, he always sent her yellow roses for every special occasion. Oh, so it's wonderful. Wanted to give him back some yellow roses. Now after seeing all those succulents up on the rooftop garden, I hope you're intrigued with the idea of using them. If not, let's head out to California. I want you to meet a friend of mine who is a true artist. She paints with succulents and does some very creative work. Come on. You know, I've admired your work for years, and I think it's some of the whimsical things that first caught my attention, like you have here, the dog and the purse, the teacup, the star. I can see you've even added a shoe to the Margie line. Yes, Alan, and you know, originally it started out with my geometric shapes, and then I decided why not take that concept and use it in more topiary shapes. Well, I saw the fountain that you did. You just took a basic fountain and filled it with, with these, yes, oh my with gosh. Four inch pots of succulents. And you know, that fountain has just been sitting out and we haven't watered it or anything, it just gets wet rain. And you know, it never rains in Southern California. Yeah, yeah, oh, it's just fantastic. Margie, give me a few of your secrets. There are tips on how you, for instance, put the dog together. My secrets is using the size appropriate cuttings. So we use the little, the littler size cuttings, and then we try to add enough texture, but you don't want to add too much or it'll overwhelm the shape. So when you start, uh, you obviously have some forms here. I guess you start with a wire. Do you wire know if form. we start with a um, metal galvanized metal form, and it has to be really heavy form because succulents are heavy. So if you do chicken wire, it's not going to hold up, yeah. and it's not. It's got to be last. up to the job. Right, then you're going to always use moss. Sphagnum moss is what we use, and we try to make sure it's fresh. Yeah, and moist. And moist. Yeah. Always have it wet before you use it. And then we use copper wire to wrap it with. Now, in some instances, I've seen people use uh, fishing line. Yes, and I use copper wire because it's going to last longer. We've wrapped it here, and you can't really see the soil, but the soil is in the so middle. So you sort right. of packed it in the core uh -huh. of the wreath, okay. So and then there it is finished. Finished, I see. And you'll see that there's a copper wire hanger on the back. Mm. And then this one, it looks like you're, you're underway with this yes, one. Yes, this is a, the beginnings of a planting. Look at that. Make sure that we plant it so it kind of hides the moss. And then what I've done is I've planted in sections. Mm because it goes much faster. I see, so you do one block of, of, of jade and then maybe drop in an echeveria uh -huh. or some other succulent. Right, this one's a sempervimum and this one is aeonium kiwi. And then we use ghost plant here. Mm -hmm. And then this is aeonium pinwheel. And so just to give it that pop. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our cutting and we're gonna pin it. And then you're gonna take your forceps and this is yeah. But people can use chopsticks. Okay. And then we're just going to make a hole. Oh, I see. So you give it a little start. And then you're going to just stick that in there. And the tighter you can get it in there, the better it's going to be. And then what you have is it's going to be wet. So of course you're going to, when you're finished wrapping, your wreath is going to be wet. It's always going to work better if it's wet. Mm. And then you don't want to rewater it until it totally dries out because if you water it too much, the roots of the succulents aren't going to form because they have such little roots anyway yeah. that the water just kind of washes them away. So and you would also, in a wreath, you wouldn't want to maybe hang it up immediately, no, would you? No, you'd probably wait a couple weeks. Let it begin to root in Let a it begin bit. to root. In the summertime, it's gonna root in a couple weeks. In the wintertime, it's gonna maybe take four weeks. The less you do with them, the happier they are. Water them when they're light to pick up. Like if you try to pick this dog up, he's really heavy. Yeah. So when he lightens up. Time to give him a drink. Give him a little drink. This one you won't be able to soak, yep. but you just kind of lightly hose him sure. down. So low on water, but lots of sun. Lots of sun, bright light. Very is the good. Best. Margie, this is just fantastic. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Even though the house isn't finished and they continue to work on it, it certainly hasn't gotten our way of using the garden to create lots of bounty. And just look at how this cabbage has come along. We planted these back in the spring, and you can see I planted them all about oh, 10 to 15 inches apart. We've harvested a few small heads, but if you'll take a look at the size of these things, they're really coming along. Now, I'm sure you've noticed there are a few worm holes here. These are from cabbage worms, and we spray BT on there to kill the cabbage worms. That's 
Bacillus thuringiensis. The name like that, you know why they call it BT. What I love about these things at this size, is you can come out here and cut one like this, and that is so sweet and delicious. One head like this will serve about, I don't know, four to six people. Now, I planted these cabbage back in the spring, very early spring. In fact, we planted them in early March. They can take cool weather. They can actually take a frost. And I plant the small plants. Uh, you can sow them directly from seed, but I've always just planted the little plants. And in this case, we use some little plants grown in peat pots. So we just dropped them right in the soil, pulled the soil up around them, and they took off. And just look at this crop. Now, if you look just to the upper side of the bed here, you can see another crop that's coming into its season. All of that shard is ready to harvest. That's rainbow shard, named because the stalks are so colorful. And if you look down here, just to my right, you'll see a beautiful nasturtium, one of my favorites because of its variegated leaf and its rich salmon blooms. These are called Alaska, really a gorgeous color. Now, what I'm gonna do is harvest about four or five of these heads. And I just wanna point out, these leaves that have some bug holes in them, we don't waste a thing around here. I'll collect all of these and throw them over the chickens and they'll go berserk over them. I have to say this is one of the most useful places out here at the Garden Home Retreat. You see, this is the overhang of the tractor barn and we use it for lots of different things. It's a great place to gather and do projects and so forth. And as you can see, it houses this vintage tractor. Now, one of the features here that I particularly like are these barn fixtures. They're not old, they're made to look old. And what's great about them is that you've got this wire cage which keeps you from breaking out the bulbs. Now, what I wanna talk about here are the bulbs themselves. What we use out here are these compact fluorescent bulbs. Now, let me tell you, the savings is absolutely staggering. According to the folks at Energy Star, if every American home replaced just one traditional incandescent bulb with a compact fluorescent bulb, we would save enough money to light more than 3 million homes for a year, more than 600 million in annual energy costs, and prevent greenhouse gases equivalent to the emissions of more than 800,000 cars. Now you've got to admit that's pretty impressive. Now this idea of saving energy with the lighting choices that we make extends into the holiday season as well. Last year, we decorated for the holidays a healing garden, a major hospital, and we used LED lights. You talk about savings. Hey, who isn't into saving money? Now, when you go to the grocery store, you're always asked at the checkout, paper or plastic? Why not say something like, hey, neither, I brought my own bag. Now, I know you can't do that if you're bringing home a lot of groceries, but just think about the impact you're having on waste. Think about all of those plastic bags that end up in the landfill and they just sit there, they don't decompose. And the other thing to think about, since we're talking about groceries, buy from local growers. One of the things we do right here at the farm is that we save every egg carton we possibly can, gather the eggs from our hens and we sell what we have extra. If you go to your local farmer's market, you'll find lots of farmers and I bet many of them produce their own eggs as well as lots of delicious vegetables. By buying from them, you're keeping the money within your regional economy, and you're not paying to have those things trucked all the way from different parts of the country, or as it is now, from other countries. Think about it. I can't tell you how much I love this front porch. It's really another room of the house. And what makes it so spectacular is, well, first, it's depth. And secondly, these beautiful Greek Doric columns that run across the front of the house. On the porch, when you look out, you see that gorgeous 350-year-old post oak. So the views from this porch really are sublime. What I'm excited about is that we're almost finished with it. They're putting the finish details. Really, the last thing that needs to be done is actually painting the decking of the floor. Okay, we're gonna paint that a classic gray and we're gonna use a porch paint for that. One of the details they've been working on here to help preserve these columns is to put a bit of metal flashing like this here on top of the caps of the columns. Now, not only have they done that here across these four Greek Doric, 
but all the way around the house. The columns on the back of the house, on the side of the house, even those little small square columns. And this will keep water from going down and really give these columns, which are so important to the house, a long, long life. Now, the idea here is to take care of details such as this, and we've tried to do that throughout the entire house. Now, I'm looking just across here to one of the columns, and I can see we have our first resident of the house. There's a pair of barn swallows who built a nest on the top capital just inside the porch. Looks like a very comfortable nest. I think I'll just let her go ahead and hatch out the babies, let the fledglings fly off with the parents, and then at some point I'll slide up there in the dark of night and take it away and they'll never know. You know, what's wonderful about a porch is it's that really classic space between indoors and out that you can decorate based on the style of the architecture that you have. I really believe as a designer that you need to meld the landscape with the architecture when you create these outdoor living spaces. It doesn't matter what style you lean toward or what you have, make sure that there's harmony between the two. You know, sometimes being green can be downright fun, like releasing these little lady beetles or ladybugs in the garden. There are thousands of them in this pouch. I ordered them through the mail. Yes, you can order this size and many, many more to turn loose in your garden. Now, when you receive them in the mail, you don't have to put them in the garden immediately, although I think that's the best practice. They can be stored in a cool, dark place like your refrigerator for up to a couple of weeks. You just want to make sure the temperature is in the 40s. They're one of the best known of the beneficial insects, and they're lots of fun. I consider them my little friends in the garden. They're so good about eating bad insects. This is a good bug that will eat a bad bug. For instance, lady beetles will eat, in the very early spring, the aphids that get on my tulips. Later in the season, they'll take care of asparagus beetle larvae. They'll also take care of beans when the thrips get on them. They'll also eat the worms from grape rootworms and the larva of the Colorado potato beetle. You see, they'll go after just about any soft-bodied insect. They're just great to have around. One adult through its entire life, which really isn't that long, will eat up to 5,000 aphids. So as you can see, they're quite voracious. And on this hot summer day, well, they're very active as you can see. And the other great thing is I don't have to put them near their food source. These little guys will find their own food source. They'll go after all of those bugs just by releasing them here. Before long, they'll be over the entire garden. Now, what's great about using these beneficial insects is, of course, we cut down on the use of any kind of chemicals in the garden. Our vegetable garden here is completely organic, so this fits perfectly with the green initiatives we've started here. And another thing that's really great about these little guys is that kids love them. It's a wonderful way to teach children stewardship in the garden. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. You know, I have to say, I'm really inspired by all these stories I keep hearing about how people both in the private and public sector are making choices that are better for the planet. And I hope some of the ideas we covered in today's show will help you make greener choices in the future. From the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at plnsmith.com.